Welcome to EHS 300, water and wastewater. And in these videos, we're gonna be focusing on private drinking water systems, what makes them private and differentiates them from being like a public system. We're gonna discuss some of the major private systems that are out there, like wells and spring houses. We're also gonna discuss some unique aspects of private water systems in the mountains of Eastern Kentucky and that those issues may be applicable to other parts of the United States and the world. And then lastly, in this section, we're also gonna discuss um, how to disinfect or treat water that comes from a private source or water that has to be obtained uh, during a disaster type situation. So, um, our first image, I show you a cover slide that has this do not drink in orange paint and this water coming out of the spring house. Now this imagery was taken from on top of Pine Mountain. These pictures I took um, maybe seven, eight years ago. And I'm gonna zoom out and I'm gonna switch over to um, a, a different screen here. So bear with me. All right, so I have switched over to this screen here and this is from Google Maps um, near uh, Harlan and Baxter, Kentucky. And you can see right here is that actual spring house and you can't see the paint on it anymore but the, there's a sign that says do not drink that's up there but uh, this is still there they haven't shut it down and you'll see why it says do not drink it used to be a popular spring um, for people from Harlan uh, from the top of Pine Mountain but now there's a lot of uh, this isn't coal this is a uh, mining like rock quarry type stuff so um, I'm gonna zoom out a little bit further so you can kind of see where this is at in the grand scheme of things. And this is we're going way zooming way, way, way out. So you can see where, you know, right here in this, well, that's not where we were at. So I'm going to pause this and go back. So I've reoriented the map for you. So there's Harlan, Kentucky. I zoom out further and further and further. You can see Lexington, Louisville. This is the Virginia state line. Knoxville's down here in Knoxville, Tennessee. So if I zoom into this spot, you'll see, you know, usually, you know, how beautiful this area is up around this spot where this particular um, well existed. So we have to head north out of Harlan on 421 and as you follow 421 north out of Harlan, it goes up into these mountains. And this is where that spring house was at off uh, 421. And you can see how gorgeous it is down there um, by using this 3D image tool. It's a very beautiful area, but when you've got this kind of uh, stuff going on up there, it does prohibit people from being able to drink their water. But when it used to look like this, which is what much of Pine Mountain still looks like, you could imagine why people would get their water there and feel pretty good about it. So Pine Mountain uh, National or State Park is and Pine Mountain State Forest are, are truly beautiful national treasures and Kentucky treasures. So that's a little bit on Pine Mountain. So. Moving back to our actual slides, um, we're going to pull up some introductory uh, materials related to source water and groundwater and all of that. So, so who's using groundwater? So here in the United States, roughly 50% of the U.S. relies on groundwater. Now many of those people that are part of that 50% actually get public drinking water from the ground. So 15 million have household water. So 15% or so of the United States population, 15 million households, so this isn't all the people, these are the houses, um, get their water from private well water. 36% of the population gets it from publicly treated sources. For example, the city of Louisville gets all of their groundwater from underneath the Ohio River. They collect it all and then they treat it all. So let me ask you, 
What percentage of the United States get their, gets their water from the ground? 50%. What percentage of people in America get their water from the ground and it's their water at their house? That's 15%. What percent of America gets their water from the ground and it's publicly sourced? That's about 35, 36%. So overall, about 50% of America gets their water from the ground. 15% of Americans get their water from the ground at their own home. And then 35% of Americans get the water from the ground, but it's collected through a public system. Public systems pertain to systems that are treating water for more than 25 people. So it could be for cities, millions of people, like Louisville, for example. All right, so hopefully that's clear. What's required for the testing? So many states and health departments have very relaxed laws on private water systems. So private wells are usually required to be inspected or permitted when they're first created. And when they are checked, they're only checked for coliforms and E. coli. And they may also look for nitrates. They may look at pH, sulfates, and iron. I ask if that's all they're looking for, is there anything missing? So we're measuring E. coli, coliforms. Then we may measure nitrates, pH, sulfates, and that's pretty much it, occasionally iron. So what's missing? Hopefully when I ask you what's missing, you're not just thinking like, oh, well, they could measure, I don't know, copper or lead, but you should be thinking they could be measuring copper, lead, PCBs, old solvents, trichloroethylene. Um, there's all kinds of other stuff. Whatever could potentially contaminate a drinking water source would be something that you may be interested in actually having measured because Let's be honest, if people are gonna be drinking this water, they would wanna know hopefully what's in it. So we don't have that luxury on private water systems and health departments don't have the luxury of testing all those things. So why are we going to check total coliforms or E. coli? Why would we look at that? Well, the assumption would be if E. coli are present, then we would assume that the risk for fecal contamination is obviously there. And as fecal contamination risk increases, the risk of gastrointestinal illness will increase for those folks as well. It's possible that there's sewage getting into their drinking water system. All right, why would we check for nitrates? Agricultural communities sometimes have a lot of fertilizer and runoff. Why would we check for nitrates? Why would we care about nitrogen, particularly nitrates in wells? Are we worried about algae blooms? No. What was that condition? Blue baby syndrome. So if there's new babies recently born or mom's got one on the way, her drinking that water could potentially cause blue baby syndrome in the embryo or in the newborn baby where the baby isn't able to get sufficient oxygen because the nitrate is binding to the oxygen. So we don't want blue baby syndrome. Babies can get killed or even uh, have loss of oxygen, which hurts their development. So is annual testing of private wells required by law? Are there national laws regulating the amount of contaminants in private wells? So by and large, there are very few laws that are out there that require wells to be tested. And it's recently been de debated um, with regards to the Clean Water Act, whether or not groundwater is actually something that's in the Clean Water Act. Can companies pollute groundwater? And I'll let you do the research on that because it's a very hot button issue right now. But once you develop your well at your house and it's been approved by the health department and approved by the state who allowed you to build the well, 
and the states are often interested in approving because they just want to make sure that you're not taking too much water out of the ground because we need water for other people. So they have to know how many wells are out there and how much water is coming out of them. But once it's been approved, there is no required annual testing for the vast majority of rural America and many communities across the country. So if it's your private well, it's on you to decide whether or not to check the water or not. All right, laws regulating well water quality. So EPA regulates public water systems. It cannot regulate private water systems. There's no authority for the EPA to tell a person that they can or cannot drink water from their private well. If they get one that's properly permitted and installed by their state with state permission or their county or city um, codes, once it's installed, they're in good shape. But EPA has no authority in that process. And on this particular image here, I've got a, a picture of a old private well. Some of these were built and grandfathered in a long time ago. So this is actually a private well at Lily Cornette Woods. EKU has an old growth forest in Southeast Kentucky. And I've spent some time at this, uh, there's a house there, an old house, the Craig Ledford home and an old apple tree there. But this well was hand dug and rock lined and it goes way down there. Um, and there are a couple uh, hand dug wells on these properties uh, that EKU has in far Southeast Kentucky. And it's really remarkable to think of how much work went in to actually making these hand dug wells. Somebody had to go down there and dig bucket by bucket out. And then as it kept being deeper and deeper, they would line it with these rocks. Um, you can imagine the effort that went into that. Nowadays, they typically drill the well. So they, they will actually, you know, have a large drilling rig and run pipe into the ground and they'll use artesian pressure to give the water the ability for the water to come out. So that was the old fashioned way. This is the more modern way. And even with some of these wells, you can see the water is not always clear coming out. So which type of wells do you think are most likely to be contaminated? You think it's easier to have a well like this to be contaminated or one that's drilled? And why? Well, hopefully you would have guessed that drilled wells get contaminated less, dug wells are more easily contaminated. And why? So dug wells, dug wells do not have a lot of the stuff that I want to show you right here. Dug wells don't have a concrete pad around the top, sometimes they do, that keeps stuff on the surface from getting up against or over top of this and against the pipe where it can run down the pipe all the way to where you're drawing your water. Dug wells often don't have this grout seal around the pipe when it goes in the ground, which is a very tight sticky nasty stuff when you put it on there but water can't get in between the pipe and the grout so that grout seal keeps the water out just like grout seal keeps the water out from underneath the tile in maybe a bathroom or an area that could get wet where they actually put grout tile down tile with grout the pipe is also lined i mean it's got a casing it's got an outer wall I mean, if it's a metal pipe it's it's cased um, and then it draws its water down here where things are a bit more loose. The other wells do the same thing here. But this type of well, there's no, there's no grout casing. There's no anything to keep this well from getting contaminated from the sides going in. So you can imagine without this concrete pad, if this just sat flat on the surface and water comes out, there could be a depression there and water could get onto this and maybe try to run down it. If an animal defecates near it or comes there for a drink of water, it could go down there and short circuit it. So that's how drilled wells are better. So well casings are also, so the pipes 
are often made out of steel or PVC. And old casings though, this is a problem with some of the older wells. The older wells, when they put the pipes together, they had to use, it's called solder, but it's spelled solder. They would have to put the pipes together. So if you've got a pipe here that's 16 feet long or eight feet long, and another pipe here that's eight feet long, you couldn't haul 100 feet of pipe down the road. Like that's not, that's not feasible, it's dangerous. Pipe would be bought in sections. So if you buy eight feet section or eight foot sections of pipe or 16 long 16 foot sections of pipe, when you're going deep into the ground and you have to make your pipes, you have to then solder them together, put them together. How do you join two pieces of metal? The way that they would join two pieces of metal was they would use solder, spelled solder. And the old metals, the old solders, used to have lead and cadmium. So old solder used to have lead and cadmium in it. And that made the metal work really well, but as water ran over it over time, there was the risk that people might get exposed to elevated levels of lead or cadmium. All right, so that's enough for these, these slides. So you should be familiar with why are drilled wells potentially more dangerous with respect to having elevated uh, lead levels or cadmium levels with respect to the pipes? Where could that come from? Which ones are more likely to contaminate? Dug wells and drilled wells. And then how do we test for private water in this country? Is it required by national law? What do state and local health departments typically look for when they're doing the initial inspection of a well, determining if it's safe for somebody to use? And then do they ever go back? And no, they do not. You know, they, many health departments only check once. Some health departments actually check more frequently, very state by state. There is no national law. And in Kentucky, they don't check all the time. They check once and it may go on for a long, long time before anybody ever tests it again. And then who's using groundwater? What percent uses public groundwater and what percent is on private groundwater? So that's enough for the review for this section. If you have questions, you can email me, jason.marion at eku.edu, or you can call or text message me as needed. So this is the first video on our private water system. So that's our first video and I'll stop it here.